It's Sunday morning, and we are in a study uh, on, we we went on Sunday night through a, about three years on a study of demons. We do not believe in demons here. We believe that the problem with the world is self, is man, his own heart. And Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. If the heart is deceitful above everything in the world, then there's nothing more evil than a man's heart. If there were such thing as demons, a demon would be a pansy upside your heart. That's what's evil is man's heart. That's every man's heart. The Bible says there is none good, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. If nobody seeks God and nobody is good, how does a man get into heaven? Well, he's dead in his sin. He can't make a decision, can he? There's this false doctrine around that you have to accept Christ as your personal Savior. That's not true. There's another doctrine that says you have to pray a sinner's prayer for salvation, and that's absolutely not true. The Bible says so. The Philippian jailer found down at Paul and Silas' feet in the 16th chapter of Acts. He said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul didn't say, Pray this prayer and mean it with all your heart. Paul didn't say, Would you like to accept Christ as your personal Savior? He said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Belief is the method of salvation. And most people will say, But I thought we were saved by faith, grace through faith. We are. Because believe and faith are the same word. In the Greek language, when, we, when I say Greek, I'm talking about the original text. We have the original text. It's called an interlinear Bible. Here's one right here. All you have to do is open up, and you'll see in the New Testament, the Greek, that's the Textus Receptus. That's where we get the King James Bible. The Greek is on the top line, and the English is right under it. And then you can begin to learn to study it. You say, but I, I don't know what those words mean. We have something called a dictionary. Here's a dictionary. It's called a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. You can look up any word in the Bible. You look it up alphabetically, and it'll give you every time that word is mentioned, and there'll be a number to the side of that. And that number will be where it's located in the Hebrew dictionary in the back, if it's Old Testament, it'll be in the Hebrew Dictionary, those square letters. If it's New Testament, it'll be in the Greek Dictionary. The New Testament was written in Greek. You look up that number, it'll tell you how it's spelled. It'll tell you what the word means. It'll tell you how to pronounce it. Now, this is not all I use. I've got a library in my home. I've got all kinds of word study books. Whenever I put something up on the board, it's the word. It's, it has a meaning to it. Now... Whenever I'm putting faith in belief, faith is the word P-I-S-T-I-S. That's the word when it was written down in the New Testament text. The word believe is P-I-S-T. Notice, notice they both have a construction uh, that's the same. P-I-S-T-E-U-O. Word endings change the meaning. Faith is the noun. Believe is the verb form of the noun. So faith, we're saved by grace through faith, and believe is the doing of faith. Now, people say, we're not saved by works. That's true, but if you don't have a working faith, you're not a believer. If Christ doesn't come alive in you, and he has to do that. The Bible says God doesn't hear sinners. A man has to be a worshiper of God and doing his will before God hears him. You can't call on a God that you don't believe in. And believe is the method. What gets me, I've heard my father, a Baptist preacher, quote this all my life. 1 Corinthians 2.14. I've heard him quote that just over and over and over. But he didn't know what it meant. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. A man that's natural, natural, does not receive spiritual things. 
If you're in your natural nature, the word is sukiyot, P-S-U-C-H-I-K-O-S. That's our word physical. And the physical man, the, this word sukikos means the sensual man. Now, a man that's sensual is a man that smells. He has the senses. He hears. He sees. He feels the touch. He is a man of the senses. He's the physical man. The man who's dead in his sin does not receive spiritual things. That word receive is the word dekomai, D-E-C-H-O-M-A-I. Dekomai comes from the word dek. Dek is the word 10 in the Greek. A decade is 10 years, isn't it? 10 years. And dekomai means to reach out the 10 fingers and accept an offer that's been presented. Dead men don't accept Christ. The Bible says so. Why is it all these preachers out here preaching that? For the same reason they're preaching all this other false doctrine, 150 years ago, the Baptist Church in America, the Presbyterian Church in America, the Congregationalists did not teach, accept Christ in a sinner's prayer. That has been propagated more by Billy Graham than any other man in the history of the church. It's just not true. <laughs> You're not going to find that anywhere in the Bible. A man has to believe, and he has to have faith, but faith is a gift of God. It has to be put into a man's heart. Now, this doctrine, along with Christmas, Christmas, Christmas is Christ Mass. It's just amazing. <laughs> they took one of the S's off the Mass. The Mass is eating human flesh. When they, when the priest raised the little Eucharist up in the air. I don't know why they have to raise it up in the air and do that. Maybe that puts them about a foot closer to God, I guess. I don't know. They raise it up in the air the words, hoc est corpus eum fili. You heard the word corpse in that? Corpus. They say that this cracker turns into the literal body and the blood of Christ. And that you have to eat that Jesus said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Well, to eat flesh and drink blood was an old ancient idiom. It meant to undergo a slaughter. Undergo slaughter. And that's you can find that over in that 39th chapter of Ezekiel. The Lord says at the end of time, and he's going to bring all of Gog and Magog against his people. He's going to slaughter the men of the earth. And he's going to say to the birds of the air, come and eat flesh and drink blood. That was an old ancient term. Jesus tells us what that means in John 6. John 6. He says, my flesh is meat indeed. So when you eat flesh, you eat indeed, whatever that is. And my blood is drink indeed. Indeed is the word A-L-E-T-H-E-S. It means of truth. So you partake in a slaughter when you eat and drink of truth because it, if it gets into your heart, it can't keep from it coming out of your mouth. And when it comes out of your mouth, people want to kill you. They get mad at you. They get enraged. They get enraged when you say, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Well, that don't mean, that means something else. It means exactly what it says. I've had people come here to the church and say, I read where the Bible says there when uh, in Romans 9, starting in verse 11, when Rebecca had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto Rebecca. Now I'm quoting from a King James Bible. He was said unto Rebekah, The elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, before either one were born. <laughs> and then people will say, Well, that don't mean that. Well, what does it mean, I loved Jacob and hated Esau, before either one were born, before either one had done any good or evil? It means he loved Jacob and hated Esau before they were born, before they'd done any good or evil. That's what it means. Boy, and people don't like that, do they? 
And I can go into love, walk in the commandments of God. And Jacob, have I loved? Jacob, have I given my commandments? And Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Who got the commandments in the Old Testament? Jacob. Did Esau get any of God's commandments? No. Man alive. All these and much more. We're talking about Christmas is Christ's Mass. It was started by Constantine in 325 A.D., Go online and look at pagan origins of pagan origins of holidays. What really disturbs me is when I was a kid, when I was about twelve years old, nineteen fifty-one, living in Fort Worth, Texas, and I had never seen a TV before, never saw one. And I went down the street, went to Bill Hunter's house. He was in my my older brothers were him in the same class. They went a grade ahead of me. Went to Bill's house, and he had this huge, humongous TV in his house. It was 12 inches. It was, I thought, golly. And I'd never seen a TV before. And I was about 12, and we'd sit and look at it in the dark. Nobody kept a light on. They'd turn all the lights off so you could see it and just gawk at it. And Daddy went out and bought a, he bought an 8-inch screen TV. The box was like this big. It had rabbit ears on it. And it was just, it was, uh, it had, we had two channels, CBS and NBC. ABC hadn't really taken hold yet. And we would watch everything. We'd watch the Saturday morning. Uh, we'd get up Saturday morning and watch the Indian head test pattern. Just to go. <laughs> we, we were so enamored by TV. It was just amazing. We couldn't get over it. And we'd watch Howdy Doody, anything that would come on. Most of y'all don't remember Howdy Doody, I guess. I know you do. But we'd watch Howdy Doody. We'd watch anything. And we'd watch the Midnight Mass. And as a little boy, 12 years old, I would sit on the couch. And Daddy was an old country Baptist preacher, had pastored little country churches, and he didn't know anything about the Bible. He never did. And I was frustrated. I thought there must be more in this. In my little analytical mind, I didn't know it was analytical, but I found out later on that I was always analyzing everything. And I'm sitting there on the couch. My feet, I was the skinniest kid in the class and always the littlest, me and one other guy. My feet didn't even reach the floor. And I'm sitting there looking as we watched the midnight mass because we had nothing else to do on Christmas Eve. We were very poor, but he got that TV. And I'd watch that midnight mass, and I would sit there and look at the Pope. I'd say, it's Christmas Eve. Is, is that Christ's mass? It, and I'm sitting there as a kid, hitting the nail on the head, not even knowing, with nobody telling me. I'm saying, is this Christ's mass? And there's the Pope, and he's doing the midnight mass. And uh, I think St. Nicholas was a... Uh, a Roman Catholic something, priest or something. I found out later on. He was a 4th century Roman Catholic bishop. He was a Catholic. St. Nicholas or Santa Claus, St. Nicholas, they, they put a spin on the word. They call it Sitter Klaus in Holland, in the Netherlands. And then it worked its way over here and we called it Santa Claus, St. Nicholas. If you pronounce it fast, Santa Claus sounds like St. Nicholas. And I'm sitting there thinking, is this Roman Catholicism? I was nailing it as a little boy. And I couldn't get over it. I mean, it just mystified me, stymied me that here we are doing Roman Catholic things. And it was years later after I studied it that I found out it is Roman Catholic. And the world doesn't care, do they? We're doing it because we're doing it for Jesus. I got a paper that I wrote a few years ago. I got to read this to you. I read it every year. I wrote this a few years ago. And I got to read this. Jesus, you wouldn't mind is the title of it. If you want a copy of it, you can get a copy of it. Jesus, you wouldn't mind. Let me read this to you. This is a prayer to Jesus about Christmas. Jesus, I know you told us the customs of the heathen are vain and not to learn the way of the heathen. I know that you told us that philosophy, which is affection for man's wisdom and vain deceit and the traditions of men and the rudiments of this world will spoil us 
and lead us back into darkness if we follow these traditions. Jesus, I realize that you told us not to add or diminish from your word over there in Deuteronomy 4, 1 and 2, and over in the 12th chapter of Deuteronomy, verse 32. And I know you said your word is pure over there in Proverbs 30 and 5, and 17 and 27. And Jesus, I understand you said your word is unchangeable in Malachi 3, 6. But you don't mind if we keep a drunken festival in your honor as long as we change the name so it sounds kind of Christian, even if it is fire worship, you won't mind, will you? Now, Jesus, we're not going to be able to stop the drunks and the pagan worshipers from continuing to keep their ancient traditions, and there'll still be a record number of suicides this time of the year, and the poor will feel oppressed. But we'll take a dinner to them at Xmas time and tell them we'll be back next year. And Jesus, there will be a record number of wrecks from drunk drivers, and the liquor stores will be thrilled to see the season come. And Jesus, Playboy even puts out a special Christmas edition. <laughs> Adultery will run rampant as husbands and wives abandon their vows at parties and you'll be real happy when you hear my idea. We've gone back into history and found fire worshipers of the ancient world who had a festival that started on December the 17th till December the 25th, the birthday of their fire god, Hercules, or Mithra, which was originally Nimrod, and they worshiped pagan gods. Jesus, here's my idea. We're going to take this drunken festival they call the Feast of Saturn or the Saturnalia, and we're going to put your name on it. And we'll call it Christ's Mass. But we'll drop an S to disguise it and pull the two words together and call it Christmas. They offered their children in the fire and ate them, but I assure you that even though most of the world will be celebrating this festival the same way they've done thousands of years before you were born, I want you to believe me when I tell you, Jesus, we won't do it that way. And when they ask us why we're dragging the church into doing something so evil, I'll tell them we don't do it that way. We're using paganism to glorify God. Jesus, doesn't that make you happy? You won't mind, do you? After all, preachers say it's okay as long as we use pagan festivals to spread the gospel. If they say it, you won't mind, will you? I promise, Jesus. We're not going to keep the customs of the heathen like they keep them. We're going to keep them different. You won't mind if we do this, will you, Jesus? Think about that. They don't like Christmas. Everything the preachers are preaching. I've been studying Bible for 58 years. At 75 years old, I can tell you, I have traveled from one end of this nation to the other. I don't hear preachers that know anything about the Bible. Billy Graham knows very little about the Bible. Charles Stanley is the boringest preacher I have ever listened to in my life. No meanings to nothing, just rattling stuff off. That's not true. Now, I can stand up here all day long and go into all of these lies. Oh, by the way, do you know that Christmas and accept Christ are the same thing? They're the exact same thing. Where did accept Christ come from? It came from the Mass. What do you mean by that? When they raise the Eucharist up, they have the, the adherence to this Roman Catholic Mass, walk down an aisle and accept the Eucharist. What they're doing in doing that, they're walking down and accepting Christ that's present in the Eucharist. That's the Mass. Accept Christ and the Mass are one and the same. Where did it come from? Henry VIII. <laughs> How's that for an answer? Henry VIII brought Accept Christ into the... He was the cause of it coming into the Protestant church. Henry VIII was a womanizer. He liked to chase women and he was married to Catherine of Aragon, the Aragon family. 
And he, the greatest thing they wanted to do was to be able to bring a son into the world to inherit the throne. Henry VIII had a son, but he died early, and he was a poor excuse for a monarch. And he kept wanting to have a son that he could raise to rule England with. Well, Catherine of Aragon had Elizabeth, who eventually became the greatest ruler that England ever saw, that the British Empire ever saw. And, but he said, I've got to get rid of Catherine because this Elizabeth, this little girl, she ain't never going to do nothing for, the, for England. I found a young girl over here, Anne Boleyn, and I want to marry her. So he petitions the Catholic Church. At that time, England was Roman Catholic. He petitioned the Catholic Church and said, I want to divorce Catherine. Of course, Catholicism will let you divorce. They said, no. He said, if you don't do that, I'll start my own church. I'll start the Church of England. And he did. And he kept in the church all the rituals, the incense, kept even the vestments of the priest. He even had his own form of the Pope. He was called the Archbishop of Canterbury. And he kept the ritual of walking down the aisle and accepting the Eucharist. The Methodist Church broke off from the Church of England in the early 1800s when John Wesley and Charles Wesley started that church. They brought this, put their spin on this walking down the aisle and accepting the Eucharist, and they put it walking down the aisle and accepting Christ and brought it into their camp meetings in the early 1800s. It bled over to the Baptist church, and now all the Baptists are talking about walking down the aisle and let Jesus come into your heart, accepting Christ, praying a sinner's prayer, and it's absolutely not true, and accept Christ is Roman Catholicism. Whether anybody likes it or not, that is the factual truth. Now, what else are we doing? We have got so many things that America doesn't even know is being taught wrong. We've been talking about demons. There's no such thing as demon. Every time you find the word devil in the text, in the New Testament, you can't find the word demon in a New Testament. Look up the word demon in your concordance. It's not there. There's no such thing as demons. Demon is the word daemonion. D-A-I-M-O-N-I-O-N. Now, daemonion comes from the root D-A-I-O. It means to distribute fortunes. Now, the Jews called all of their sins, they said it was demons. They said their gods were demons. This was the deification of their ancestors. It was ancestor worship. And they said their ancestors were guardians, guardian angels, and that they would guide them either to good or bad fortune. Now, what the Jews call demons, the Arabs call genies. Well, genie comes from the word gene. Is not that the same thing as your ancestor? It's the same thing. It's what your makeup is. And the, the Celts call them fairies. Don't you get wishes from genies and fairies? You get wishes. And the wishes you get is all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. That's everything in the world. And Eve saw a tree that was good for food. It was pleasant to the eye, and it would make her wise. That's the Christmas tree. It's the tree in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's the gifts of the tree. And the pagans said the tree goddess was the giver of all divine gifts to men. And the tree goddesses were Venus, Aphrodite, Ceres, Sybil, and the list goes on and on. Now, we've been talking about casting out devils. The word means to distribute fortunes. Doesn't the Bible say the love of money is the root of all evil? Love of money. And love of money is the word philogoria. P-H-I-L-A-R-G-U-R-I-A. Philogoria. It, it is a construction of philos, one of the words that's been translated love, the other word is agape. You have the word agape and phileo. 
phileo. Both of these words have been translated love. Sometimes the word agape has been translated charity. Every time you find charity, it's agape. Agape is walking in the commandments of God, 2 John 6. 6, walk, this is love, this is agape. How do you know which word it is? You look it up in the concordance. And after a while, you get to where you recognize what word it is. This is love that we walk after his commandments, walk after the commandments of God. People say, you need to love, you need to speak the truth in love. Well, in, there in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, speaking the truth in love. If you speak the truth in love, truth is the word aletheia, A-L-E-T-H-E-I-A. If you speak it in love, you speak it in agape. That's what they would say in the first century. You speak aletheia in agape. Aletheia comes from, what, this is the word truth. This is the word love there in Ephesians 4. And aletheia is a construction of lanthano. Lanthano. And that means to lie hid. To lie hid or conceal. Or to conceal. When you place the alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet in front of a word, it's called, when you place it as a negative particle, negative particle, it's called the alpha privative. Alpha privative. And the alpha privative negates the word and gives an opposite meaning. Alanthano means not to hide anything. And that translates aletheia or the word truth. So when you speak the truth, you don't hide anything. You pull the cover off. You say, well, here's the subject and here's the verb. There's the rest of the predicate. There's the direct object. There's the predicate nominative. Here's either the action or the being verb. And here's the subject. And here's the modifiers. And here's the culture. And here's the custom. And here's what they meant when they said something. You pull the cover off as you walk in the commandments of God. You have to walk. Speaking the truth in love don't be... Don't mean tell the people truth and be nice to them while you say it. It's, not, it's just another ignorant thing that people got in their minds. It's awful hard to tell somebody the truth when they're being completely rebased against God and make them feel good about it, isn't it? Now, where were we? We're, at, but we're over here at the word demon. Now, we're talking about casting out demons. Let me put a list on the board. People don't even know what a demon is. Jesus said demons were self. In Mark, the first chapter, he runs into a man that's got an unclean spirit. Unclean spirit. Now, in the Bible, you have a precedent set. A precedent means if you can find something in one place that's equal to something else, if you find that everywhere you find it, this is how you have to study the Bible. Everything you find over here in Genesis is going to be the same thing you find in Revelation. God doesn't change. Evil doesn't change. Truth doesn't change. So unclean spirit. You find a man in the temple with unclean spirit, and you go to Luke 4, and it gives Luke's account. Luke's account of the same man, and it calls it an unclean demonion. Unclean demon or unclean devil is the way it says it in the Greek, in the English text. So if it's an unclean demon here, it's an unclean spirit over here, whatever Jesus calls it over here, it's going to be the same thing over here, isn't it? Remember who's doing the talking. Can you trust some guy who's got an unclean spirit when he starts talking? Can you trust his words? No, you can't. In Luke, the 8th chapter, when the man of the Gadarenes said, I, I got, these, uh, got all these female demons in me. I got uh, 3,000 of them, a legion of them. You can believe that man? He's out of his mind living in the tombs, cutting himself all over. That was the culture of the day to say, if a man's going wacky, to say he had a demon. Jesus rebuked him. 
If you notice him is singular, it's actually the word A-U-T-O. Now they said demons came in hordes. Over in Luke 8, the guy said, I got 3,000, I got a legion in me. And he used the word legion, L-E-G-E-I-O-N, which is feminine gender. They said most of the demons were feminine. And they came in great hordes and possessed you. Where did he get his degree in demonology? Do I believe that guy? No, I don't believe him. And Jesus rebuked him. And that is the word A-U-T-O. It's our word auto. And when they made automobiles, they quit having them pulled by horses and made them self-mobile. Auto is a Greek word. Our word auto. If you have an auto out here in the parking lot, it's a Greek word. It means self. Him, his, her, self. They're all a form of the same word in the Greek. He just rebukes self. Masculine gender singular is what he rebuked. How do you know that, Jim? I pick up a I pick up an analytical lexicon. I look at it alphabetically in the Greek and it tells me exactly that. Now, if you come here, I'll teach you how to study the Greek text. Now, so Jesus rebuked self. Now we're talking about if so everywhere we've set a precedent here. A demon is an unclean spirit, is self. So everywhere, so the precedent would go everywhere in the New Testament thereafter that you find a demon, it's going to be self. Now, the, now they would call a demon their gods. They would say when a man was sick, he had a demon. They would say it was a god that came inside of him, made him sick. We don't believe that. That's a bunch of foolishness. I have traveled all over America as a young preacher in the 60s. I've been in many Pentecostal churches. Somebody said, oh, this man's got a demon. I didn't see any such thing. They let their imagination get crazy. It's just not true. You cannot, let me say this again and, and take this real firm. If you leave definition of a word, you've left the truth. I don't care how emotional you feel about it. My, I know how the Baptists think, but I know what they taught 150 years ago, too, and they weren't the same as they are today. They taught predestination. They taught that Christmas was pagan. The most famous Baptist preacher in the 1800s was a man named Charles Spurgeon. He preached predestination straight down the line. He preached that God does not love everybody. He said that Christmas was an abomination. I know what they preach. Now, we're talking about casting out devils. Cast out devils. If you cast out demonion, you're casting out self, aren't you? And we're talking about that, and we're also, I got a list of things here that I've written down. Well, I don't know what I did with my list. These are things that we're talking about when you're talking about casting out devils. I'll just put them up here. I know what they are. Cast out devils, Spirit of God, Kingdom of God. Wait a minute. Let me put truth, Word of God, Kingdom of God, Now, we're talking about all these because they're all related and have to do with each other. Kingdom of God, Gentile church, Gentile church, spirits in prison, the Gentiles coming to the light, they were in darkness. Now, the way you find out what all these things mean and how they come together, you define words. Well, that, definition is everything. If you go and I had a 
scientist called me from South Carolina. He said he worked on the nuclear project at Cape, Cape Kennedy. He said, I've never seen a man break down the Bible in as many minute parts as you do. He said, you teach Bible the same way I teach science. He said, I break everything down. He said, that's the only way you can find out what it means. You have to stay with definition. I know that the world is in the shape they're in because we're in the apostasy. We have to be in the apostasy. Paul said, the day of the Lord will not come there in 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3. The day of the Lord will not come except there come a falling away first. Falling away. That's what all this is about. Falling away. That's kind of a nice phrase, but that's not the word exactly. The word is, op it's one word in the Greek, apostasis. The church is in an apostasis. We call that A-P-O-S-T-A-S-Y. Now, anytime you see stasis, that means to stand upright. Apo, apo means to set off or off with. It means to set off standing upright. From stasis, you have morphemes. Morpheme means word shapes. Now, I've got books on morphemes, and you can find morphemes simply by looking up one word in your concordance and look at the surrounding words or look at when it says, uh, if you're looking up a word and it says from 2742, look up 2742. It means it's in the word more, it's in the morphemes structure. Well, morpheme means word shapes. Well, in the morphemes of stasis, you have the words S-T-A-O, H-I-S-T-E-M-I. Of course, remember, there's no H's in the Greek. There's a, there's a breathing sound, a diacritical mark, but it's an H sound. And then you have uh, the word staros. Staros is the word cross. So if there's a removal of standing upright, there's a removal of the daily cross. Do I hear anybody talking about a daily cross? You have to take a cross daily. Jesus said, if you don't bear your cross and, and follow after me, you cannot be my disciple. You cannot learn the word of God. Disciple is the word mathetes. We got a word mathematics from that. It means a learner. You cannot learn without a cross. You have to crucify self in order to come to these truths, you're not going to be popular if you, if you embrace Christmas. Christmas is pagan. But the stronger you get, the longer you live, the more you're willing to stand. I'm willing to stand against anybody and everybody for God's truth. I don't want to please my mother. I don't care if my father was pleased before he died. My brothers and sisters, I don't care if my daughter likes it or not. I don't care if Eric likes it or not. I don't care if Mary likes it or not. I'm going to stand in the truth, period. And when you stand in truth, you make enemies. Jesus preached and they killed him for his words, didn't they? That's right. One of the most astounding verses in the Bible to me, our section of verses there in in John 15, 18 to 19, 20, Jesus said, if the world hated me, it will hate you. If it persecuted me, it will persecute you. He said, don't be surprised when the world hates you and persecute you. They did me. Well, what he's saying, if you're a believer, you have to be hated by the world at large. What are you going to be hated for? Going to some Baptist church or some Pentecostal church? Or some methods, they ain't gonna hate you for that. They're gonna hate you when you say predestination is true and God does not love everybody. He said so, and Christmas is pagan. They're gonna come after you for that. They're gonna say, You're in a cult. You're crazy. To please God, you have to take a hard line stand for the truth, don't you? Now, where are we? We're talking about casting out devils. How are devils cast out? Back one more time. Let's go back to Matthew. Oh, we got to put up here, binding the strong man. Bind strong man. Bind 
Satan. But you see, you can't just take these words in English. That word bind is the word dio. Dio. The Holy Spirit is truth. The word of God, thy word is truth. So this is the same. The Holy Spirit is truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17, John 15, 16, John 16, 26, John 15, 13, 1 John 5 and 6, the Bible says, The Spirit is the truth. John 17, 17 says, Thy word is truth. Therefore, the Spirit of God is the truth, is the word of God. Now, let's read Luke. Reading out of a King James Bible, this amazes me. I've never heard anybody even comment on this. Matthew, the 12th chapter. Matthew 12. A man was said to be Possessed with a demon. Goodness sakes, shouldn't we define that word, possessed with devils? Possessed with devils. Is one word in the Greek. One word. It's the word D-A-I-M-O-N-I-Z-O-M-A-I. Notice it is a form. It is a form of daemon, daemonion. It is a form of d-a-i-m-o-n-i-o-n. It's a form of daemonion, which is the word, our word demon, which is self. Well, daemonizomai, possessed with devils, when you go into your McClinic and Strong, they'll tell you that's a word that means to be in Insane. 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 And the man in Luke 8, when he came to his right mind, S O P H R O N E O. So for now means sane mind. So what went into the pigs was the desire for self, and the man was living among the tombs, cutting himself, acting like a fool, thinking he could keep his ancestors there so he could consult with the familiar spirits. And boy, that's another story. Familiar spirits, the word bottle, and you keep genies in bottles, and they said vampires were demons. You had to drive a vampire in a bottle, and that was 2,000 years ago, long before Bram Stoker wrote his book. And I can talk all day long on demons and genies, and I've done a lot of studying on this. Now, he says here in Matthew 12, Matthew, the 12th chapter, all right, the man is possessed with devils or he's crazy. It's amazing that nobody ever looks at the Bible and looks for crazy people in it. There's a lot of crazy people in there, you know. And they were all said to be possessed with devils. I believe it's just possessed with self to such a degree you just want to lift up self. Those people out here in Central State are just a hair removed from those that live out here in Governor's Point. These are rich out here, and those never were able to obtain it, and they just went off the deep end because they couldn't have what all these people got, and they're all going to get to go to hell together if they don't repent of sin. Now, then he says in verse 28, If I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, how are devils cast out? By the Spirit. The Spirit of God is what cast out devils. Let me just give you the other verse. Over here in Luke. In Luke 11. Same man. Just like we said in Mark 1. And in uh, Luke 4. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. And they have a synonymous view. Anytime they repeat something. And Luke is repeating the same man in the same situation except he doesn't say if i cast down devils by the spirit of god here's the way luke puts it but if i verse 20 chapter 11 if i would the finger of god cast out devils what happens when you cast out devils both of those verses finger of god then the kingdom of god is coming to you but you have to know what the kingdom of God is. Kingdom of God was an old ancient term for Israel because God was their king. There in Hosea, the 13th chapter, 
In 1 Samuel, the 12th chapter, the Bible says, God was your king, Israel. Well, Israel is the Jews. Who's king of the Jews? Jesus. Before Jesus was incarnate in the flesh, he was the Jehovah of the Old Testament. There is the Father, God the Father, and there is God the Son, and there is God the Holy Spirit. But he is the Jehovah, and with his finger in Deuteronomy 9, he writes on tables of stone and keeps those tables of stone, which are the commandments of God, inside the Ark of the Covenant and sprinkles the Ark of the Covenant. Now he writes on fleshy tables of our heart in 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, and sprinkles our, and our hearts are sprinkled. So we are the spiritual Israel. We're the spiritual Jew. Now, I want us to go back over this binding of Satan. Where do we see it? Over in the, over in the book of Revelation. Revelation 20. Let's go back over there. Revelation, the 20th chapter. We don't believe in a millennium here at Grace and Truth. We do not believe in pre-trib rapture. Where did that come into America? In the 1830s, a man named J.N. Darby brought pre-trib rapture to America. He said a young girl named Marie, I forget her last name. Was it Marie McDonald? What? Anyway, this young girl stood up in Mr. Darby's meeting and said she had a vision. She's 15 years old and said she had a vision. The church was going to be taken out and raptured out before the tribulation. Well, the Bible says we're going to be changed. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. Behold, I'll show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Sleep was a term for dead believers. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Our change is going to be at last trump. Last is the word eschatos. Get a word eschatology from that, the study of the end times. Last means the last in a series after which no other trumpet will sound. you got seven trumpets sounding in Revelation 8, 9, and 10. When the seventh one sounds, the mystery of God, which is the church, is complete, and Christ puts one foot on the land, the other in the sea, and says, time is no more. He doesn't say time is no more except for a thousand years. A thousand years would be time, wouldn't it? We don't believe in a thousand-year reign. Premillennialism, let me explain this to you. This is another one of the false doctrines. It's, it's rampant in the church. These people that come up and talk about pre-trib rapture, you got seven trumpets that sound at the end of time. The Bible says in Matthew, the 24th chapter, the, disciples, the apostles come to Jesus and say, Lord, when will these things be and what will be the sign of thy coming of your parousia, P-A-R-O-U-S-A-A? What's going to be the sign of your physical arrival? And he goes through all these signs, and he says, Well, many will come in my name, saying I'm Christ, and they'll deceive many. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. The love of many, the agape, walk in the commandments of God, will wax cold. Wax cold means to die. He says, Walk in God's commandments will wax cold. Then he said, you'll see the abomination of desolation. Then after that, he said, there will be great tribulation such as was not from the beginning, no, nor ever shall be. We're headed for the worst times that we've ever seen. And then he says, after the tribulation, what well, he says, as the lightning shines from the east to the west there in verse 28, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So shall also the perusia of the Son of Man be, the physical arrival. And then he says, after the tribulation of those days, the Son of be Now, everything after this, after verse 29, all the way to the end of the chapter is all about what's going to happen at the very end. After the tribulation of those days, the Son will be turned to darkness. That's very, that is very metaphoric language. Son to darkness, the, the prophet said, is where that there will be no truth. 
the moon turned to blood. For something to turn to blood meant to die with. If the moon dies, then it's not reflecting the light from the sun anymore. And this is, this is prophetic language. And then he says, the Lord shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. The last one hadn't sounded before that, has it? And we're at the end of the, we're at the, end of the tribulation. Now, let me give you this, what these guys have come up with called dispensationalism. It's really a bad doctrine. Dispensation. Dispensationalism is where that they teach, or they teach periods of time. They say Adam lived under innocence, and Noah lived under conscience, and Moses lived under the law. And then they say, you've got the New Testament, New Testament church, and that's the, what they call the age of grace, age of grace. And then they say, you've got the tribulation, but they have a pre-trib rapture. That can't be true. We're going to be changed at the last trump. Pre-trib rapture. Rapture means to be carried out with joy. It's a Latin word. It means to be carried away with joy. And then you got a tribulation. They say that's for the Jews only. Jews only. This thing gets really messy at the end of time. And then you got a seven-year tribulation. Uh, seven years, excuse me. You got the seven years, which is split in two. You got three and a half years which the, the Revelation calls it 42 months, which is half of seven years on a Jewish calendar. 42 months. And on the same Jewish calendar, 1,260 days is three and a half years on a 360-day Jewish calendar. 360 days. 1,260 days or time times and half times. That's three and a half years. And then they say they've got a thousand-year reign after this all over with. Premillennialism means they say Jesus is coming back at the beginning of the tribulation when we're going to be changed at the last trump. And when he comes back, he's going to conquer all of his enemies according to Revelation uh, 11 and 15. And that last verse of Philippians, the third chapter, we'll change our bodies according to the same operation whereby he is able to subdue all things to himself. When he subdues all things, all, let me put it this way, he subdues all enemies, he puts all enemies under his feet according to the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. He subdues all enemies at the change of our bodies. Change of bodies. If that is true, and it says it twice there in the scriptures, that he's going to change our body according to the same Energeo, E-N-E-R-G-E-O. Er ergon means to work. To work in is the word in ergon, and that's the word, our word energy. He's going to subdue his enemies by the change of our bodies. Well, if that's true, what's he doing? If he, if he comes and the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. There in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. But well, if death is going to be destroyed when he comes, how can people be dying through the tribulation? How can Satan rise up at the end of the thousand years, supposedly thousand year reign? We don't believe in that thousand year reign. We believe the thousand years, the word thousand is kilia, C-H-I-L-I-A. It means 2,000 or more. It's plural. Any multiple of 10, 100, or 1,000 was a form of the original number. One was not a number, according to the ancients. They said it was a generator of numbers. Therefore, 1,000 is singular. Speaking in increments of, speaking in increments of thousands, kilia would be 2,000 or more. We believe that the so-called 1,000 years is actually the 2,000-year period from the coming of Christ to the end of time. Actually, from at least Acts 2, where God pours out of his Spirit on all flesh. Now, what did we say the Spirit was earlier? The Holy Spirit's truth, isn't it? 
Who got the truth in the Old Testament? Forget this dispensationalism. Dispensation is the word O-I-K-O-N-O-M-I-A. It's the same word as stewardship. I don't know why they put... It's the same word as stewardship. Dispensation, it comes from oikos, meaning house. And nomos, the Greek word law, means... The Greek word for law, it comes from house law. It means the law of the house of God, whose house are we? It's the law that lives in us. He writes it upon our hearts. Now, we believe not a pre-trib rapture. This is what the church in America believed up to about 200 years ago, and they have polluted it with all of this apostasy, giving people all this excitement. The world's looking for some things that's just not true. You can read, you can read Revelation commentaries from 300 years ago. It don't read anything like a Revelation commentary from today. These guys that write stuff today, it's junk. That includes John MacArthur. John MacArthur's got those scorpions coming up out of the bottom of his pit. It's uh, demons. Uh, the charismatics has made them helicopters. <laughs> Scorpion was the word used in the Middle East for a false teacher. They're false teachers. And it's not bottomless pit. It's a place of no knowledge. Abusos comes from bathos, means something with great knowledge. Placing the alpha in front of that, it means no knowledge. They come up from a place of no knowledge. And the Lord told Israel in Ezekiel the second chapter you dwell among scorpions over there in Babylon be not afraid of their words scorpions are people it's not helicopters and it's not demons it's false teachers goodness sakes you guys I can't believe these guys say the stuff they say you know how you you know why I feel that way I spent 58 years of digging and researching and I don't care what my father says. I don't care what my Baptist friends said when I was coming up. And I knew a lot of important Baptist theologians. Don't care what they said. If you approach the Bible analytically and objective, you'll dismiss everything. You'll forsake everything and say, give me the truth, Lord. I don't care if mama believes it. I don't care if brother and sister believes it. I don't care if daddy believes it. I don't care if my wife or husband believes it. I want it, Lord, if it's what you said. That's a hard place to come to, isn't it? And I've come there. I don't have much longer to live. Anybody in their mid seventies don't have much have longer to live, Stan. You ain't got you ain't gonna live much longer, neither you can. We're all close to the same age. What? Huh? Yeah. Well, Mary wanted to remind me of first Thessalonians the fourth chapter where that we which are alive and remain of the coming of the Lord shall not go before those that are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. That word shout is the word kaluo. It means a war cry. Now what in the world is Jesus doing making a war cry? A secret coming. That's ridiculous. Okay, uh, men, attack. Okay, come up here, church. Let's go back here for seven years. That's ridiculous. That's stupid. We were to alive and remain. P-E-R-I-L-E-I-P-O. Survive. It doesn't mean we're remaining here on the earth. We're walking around doing our jobs. To survive a great slaughter. We in the church would survive the great slaughter. We remain. The Lord's going to come with a war cry there in First Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. And that fourth chapter, that's the chapter that bore all the pre-trib rapture is love. And you're not, you don't know what words mean. He's not making a war cry at a secret coming. There's not two comings of Jesus. It's not true. Now, where was I? Goodness sakes. Now, there's some things I want you to see. This time period, this time period from Jesus, or at least from Acts 2. 
Acts 2, where God pours out of his spirit on all flesh. It just occurred to me when I was studying this 30 years ago or 40, I can't remember when, that all flesh would be opposed to some other flesh. How about the one flesh? As opposed to one flesh from Adam until Jesus. The one flesh was was Adam had a son whose name was Seth, and Seth had a son whose name was Enosh, and Enosh had a son whose name was Canaan, and Canaan had a son whose name was Mahalaleel, and Mahalaleel on down to Jared and and uh, Enoch and Lamech and or Methuselah and Lamech and Noah. Noah had a son whose name was Shem, and Shem's name from Shem we get Semitic, and this is the Jewish race. And then you get on down in that 11th chapter of Genesis and you get down to, to our facts at his son and down to Serug and Reu and P, Peleg and, and all of these guys. or well, Serug's down here, uh, Enosh up here. And then you get to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob's name is changed to Israel. He's got 12 sons that become the nation, starting with, starting with Reuben all the way down through Simeon and Levi and Judah all the way down to, to Benjamin. Joseph is the 11th son. And that's one flesh. God gave his truth to one flesh, and the Gentiles were in the dark. They were not allowed the truth on the whole, were they? What do you mean, God didn't love them? No, he didn't love them. You think he loved the Amalekites when he told Saul, go down to Amalek and utterly destroy the Amalekites. Kill all of them. And is there a reason for that? Yes, and I'm not going to go into all that right now. Now, so all flesh would be red, yellow, white, black, and brown flesh. This would be the all flesh, and there's a word, S-Y-N-E-C-D-O-C-H-E. Synecdoche is a word among the Jews that meant a part of something was the whole of something. They said if one red man, one yellow man, one white man, one black man, one brown man was saved, that all flesh would be saved, all flesh. So when the Bible says God would have all men be saved, all men will be saved, but every individual will not. How could God want all men to be saved when he's got vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, Romans 9, 22? They're fitted, katortidzo. Fully accomplished. Fully accomplished. How could he want all every individual to be saved when he's got in first in second Peter two twelve he speaks of these self willed men, they are natural brute beasts made made Ganea. Get the word from gene. It means born to be taken and destroyed. They were born for destruction. Well, I don't like that, Jim. Well, then you don't like God. They were born to be destroyed. They're the same man of Jude 4. These are men before of old ordained to this condemnation. Before ordained is the word prographo. It comes from pro, which is our word pre. Pre. It means before. And the word graphe is our word graph, but it's a, it's a Greek word that means to write. Their names were written down beforehand to be destroyed. The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Now, how can that be true? And then God want every man to be saved. He doesn't. He wants all men or all flesh, and he poured out of his spirit on all flesh. For the last 2,000 years, this has been going on. We very well could be close to the end of that. If we're close to the end of time, then the church has to be very apostate. 
The church has to be a long way from truth. This is not the same world I lived in in 1950 as an 11-year-old. Ain't even close. Let me tell you, young people, we're nowhere even near where we were back then. And it was bad enough back then. That was before computers and cell phones and... Uh, yeah, even 10 years. It, it, it's certainly not the... It's certainly not the world 25 years ago. It was like living on another planet in 1950. It's like, what has happened? We are so wicked in this world. And the preachers, I hear them say, we need to take America back. And never has, America has never been with God. They say, we need to go back to the church fathers. That's another part of the apostate information. We're not told the truth about American history. Thomas Jefferson was no more Christian than some bug flying out here in the parking lot. He was a heathen, a womanizer. He had women all over Europe. Sally Hemings is not the only one he had an illegitimate baby by. And Thomas Jefferson did not believe God. He believed in... Thomas Jefferson was a self confessed deist. So was Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin was a heathen. What did he live for? A worthlessness. You could even watch Ben Franklin, some of his stories on some of the documentaries on History Channel, and they'll tell you he was a member of this sex club in Europe and he had all these women and he was crazy and he was he was a fruitcake. And so was George Washington was a deist. He was not a Christian. America was not founded on Christianity. Even, I'll tell you what you do. You get Richard Shankman's books. Go over to Books a Million or go to Barnes & Noble and say, I want to order some of books by Richard Shankman, S-H-E-N-K-M-A-N. He's a historian, a Harvard graduate, used to research for the Library of Congress, has a doctorate in history, and... <laughs> He'll tell you the truth about American history. I've told the story so many times. I went into history class in Texas A&M in 1957, and the history professor said the first thing out of his mouth was, they will not let me tell you the truth about American history in 1957. He said, I'll give you just the facts that they want me to give you, and you give them back to me on test, but it's not the truth. It's... You really want to know the truth about American history. Go to that history section at Barnes & Noble. If they don't have Shankman or James B. Lowen, you can see Richard Shankman and James B. Lowen on C-SPAN from time to time. And they write these books and tell you the truth. Shankman, S-H-E-N-K-M-A-N. People act like I made this stuff up. Boy, if I made all this up, I'm really good, you know. I didn't make this stuff up. Now, where was I? Now, what we believe, we believe that this time period right here is what they've changed into millennium. Jesus is coming back at the end of time. That'll be the last time. We'll go into the tribulation period, but there's not going to be an announcement. There's not going to be a rapture. Wouldn't it be crazy for millions of people to disappear on the earth and people going around and going, what happened? Uh, that would kind of put an international alert, wouldn't it? It's not like, oh, well, let's get back to living. Ridiculous. I hate pre-trib rapture. I hate that thing. It's the worst no nothing. I've said this before. All of the American evangelical church believes in a pre-trib rapture, and it is without a doubt the most useless has absolutely no biblical foundation whatsoever. Last trump is when we're going to be changed. Jesus put one foot on the land, the other on the sea, in Matthew 10 and 6, 10, 5 and 6, and then says in verse 7, he says, the last, the seventh trumpet sounds and time is no more. I've never even heard a preacher preach or a doctor of theology talk about time factor as to the last trump. Never heard him want him address it. My father never did. His friends never did. We believe that God will take us out of here. God won't cause his saints to suffer. 
What do you mean he won't cause his saints to suffer? What about the Inquisition where 60 million Jews and Christians died at the hands of the Roman Catholic Church? I mean, that's why Christmas was outlawed in early America. It's real simple. I told somebody the other day. I said, I've got on the back of one of my shirts. And it says, it was against the law to celebrate Christmas in early America. And this lady, or this man said, why was it against the law to celebrate Christmas in early America? And I told him, I said, well, you know what the Puritans are. Yeah. I said, well, they had another family name when they were in Europe. They were called Albigenses. It was an Albigens family, Huguenot, Huguenot family, the Waldens family, and they had been building for 100, 200 years. These families, and they believed in predestination. They believed in the sovereignty of God. They didn't celebrate these pagan holidays. And they were slaughtered. You can get Fox's Book of Martyrs, and they were slaughtered by the millions. They were tortured. So when the, these families said, let's go to this new land called America, and we'll rename ourselves, and we will call ourselves Puritans. The reason we'll do that is because we're going to purify this new land of all papal influence. Papal is Roman Catholic, and they outlawed Christmas. They said, we will not have any part of Roman Catholicism in this new land. Well, a few years later, the law was repealed by the Universalists and Unitarians. And the Protestants wouldn't have anything to do with it till nearly 1900. Didn't have anything to do with it. America's only been celebrating Christmas about 125 years. That's it. It's not, it never was a Christian holiday. It is the feast of Saturn of the ancient world. Jesus was God in the flesh. He was born of a virgin in Bethlehem in a manger. But the Christ mass has nothing to do with him. You deal with it, deal with it or not. I'm at a place I don't care. I just get blunt. Hey. I have no time to play with you. Either believe God or don't. Now, let's go back over here to, this is the time period. Well, let me go back to, gosh, let me go back to Revelation, the 20th chapter. How much time do I have, Mike? It's taking me forever to get going into this 20th chapter. I'm just going to kind of cover a few things. If you hadn't been here. I saw an angel come down from heaven having a key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Remember, bottomless pit is the word A-B-U-S-S-O-S. -S -S. It's our word abyss. abyss. Abusos comes from the word bathos. Bathos means a place of great knowledge or learning. It's a place of great knowledge. When you place the alpha, first letter of the Greek alphabet in front of a word, as a negative particle, this is the way this word is constructed. The alpha in front of bathos translates abusos. It negates the word. It means no knowledge. The word bottomless bit means a place of no knowledge. Well, you've got, you got scorpions coming out of the pit in Revelation 9, but a scorpion was a false teacher. False teacher. We know that because Scorpios is the noun. And Scorpizo is the verb. And the verb is the same word that was used in John 10 when, when the Bible says the hireling, the man who preaches for money. He doesn't allow the, he allows the wolf to come in. As soon as you see wolf, what do you think of? When you see wolf, think Matthew 7, Acts 20. Jesus said wolves. He said, beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. Sheep's clothing, what that means, that had a meaning. All the shepherds wore the sheep of the flocks that they sheared. So they wore wool coats. What he's saying, beware of Wolves, beware of preachers that come looking like preachers wearing their three-piece suits. He said they're wolves in sheep's clothing. 
Paul said, when I leave here at Ephesus, grievous wolves are going to come in, not sparing the flock. Wolves were, were people that ripped the church apart, were false teachers. So whenever Jesus said, the hireling cares not for the sheep, he allows the wolf to come in and scatter the flock, scatters the verb form of scorpion. Wolves are false teachers, scorpions are false teachers. Remember Ezekiel, the second chapter, you dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words. So scorpions come out of the place of no knowledge, out of the bottomless pit. That's a terrible word. And then you find in Revelation 11, the beast comes out of the bottomless pit. The beast is Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. That's the Babylonian lion, the Persian bear, the Grecian leopard, and the beast with iron teeth, and that's in that's in in Daniel the seventh chapter, and in Revelation the thirteenth chapter. That's the world ruling system. Well, the world ruling system didn't come up out of a hole in the ground; it came out of a place of no knowledge, and it had its borders upon the sea, upon this pit, and only Israel had the knowledge of God. The beast has no knowledge of God. And you've got Satan bound in the bottomless pit or the place of no knowledge. By, bound, Satan is bound, Dio, same word that's used over in Matthew 12, binding the strong man. The strong man is self. And that word bind means to forbid. God forbids us from living in these bodies when we come to the knowledge of Christ. You're not your own, you're bought with a Christ. Glorify God in your body. Quit living the way you want to live. We believe that we were predestined to conform to Christ's likeness, to the image, the icon of Jesus, and that means likeness. We've been predestined to be like Jesus. Well, didn't he walk in God's commandments? He walked righteously. What does it take to make a man walk righteously? Whole lot of fire. Whole lot of trials, doesn't it? Remember my favorite one of my favorite things to put on the board is the inner and the outer man. Paul speaks of in Romans, the seventh chapter, he said, you got an inner man, which is Christ in you, and he serves the law of God. You got outer man that's self. And it takes God a lot of years to get rid of self. That's the new birth that's in you. That's born again right there. That's Jesus, the inner man. And the outer man has got contention and strife and and anger and pride and arrogance and the list goes on and on and over the years fire and trials is going to get rid of that outer man but you do have the new birth those that have the new birth he's going to require that self die and that's taking our cross and dying daily isn't it that's hard for everybody to do isn't it if any man will come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross every day and die and follow me now, and he's bound 2,000 years. There's a 2,000-year period where Satan is for... Notice this. I have tried to say this and make it clear. There's a 2,000-year period, and this is what the church used to believe. There's a 2,000-year period from Jesus, particularly Acts 2, when the, that's the birth of the New Testament church, when all flesh, how is that going to be all flesh? Because the Jews were scattered in the Old Testament because for 500 years they went after Baal. They went after Grove. Baal was the sun god. The Grove was the tree goddess. This was the same thing. It was brought in the church in 325 A.D. by Constantine, 325 A.D. at the Nicene Council and renamed the Christ Mass. It was the same system that they celebrated. They celebrated in Rome and called it the Feast of Saturn. And the reason they had it was because December the 17th through the 24th, that was a seven-day festival, and they were appealing to the Father, the God, Saturn. And they wanted his son to come back, which was the sun god, they thought the sun was burning out. I explained this to somebody out in public the other day. This woman, I was down at some shoe store. I said, well, 
the winter solstice is December the 21st. December the 21st is the longest nights of the year. Longest nights. Here in Middle Tennessee, we can see that. In the middle of summer, at the summer solstice, June 21st, that's the longest days of the year. That's six months before. And the sun goes down about 845 in Middle Tennessee, June the 21st. It goes down. The sun sets here. We're getting close. At the 21st, it'll be set about 420 to 430. And when you go home from work, you'll be driving in the dark, won't you? The pagans said, we think the sun is burning out. We've got to have a festival and appeal to the Father of the gods. And we've got to get the sun to come back. We think the sun is moving away from the earth. That was because you have the, you have the, sun, you have the earth here. You have the sun. You have the, excuse me, you have the sun here. You have the earth going around the sun. And it sets on an axis that tilts. It's 26 degrees. And when it gets over here in the northern hemisphere, you're tilting further away from the sun. And that's the darkest time of the year. I've got a T-shirt that says the tilt of the earth axis is the reason for the season. And that's when you get to December the 21st. It look, and so that's when the darkness comes in the northern hemisphere. When it gets over here, that's the, it's tilting toward the sun. And these are the longest days of the year. And this is called summer over here. And this is called winter over here. So, so they give a birthday to the unconquerable sun. They pick out December the 25th in the ancient world. That was birthday of Mithra, the fire god of the romans and it was the feast of saturn that they were celebrating it don't matter whether anybody believes it or not go on the internet look up pagan origins of holidays it'll tell you all about it people act like i made this up good night why would i make it up you just want to be a cult you're ignorant too gosh what idiocy i didn't make this i, I made it i made up george washington is the father of our country Everybody wants to start arguing with you. Well, he is. It's like saying two plus two is four. You made that up, Jim. No, I didn't. I got it from my teacher in the second grade. But this can't be true because I don't have on a three-piece suit and I'm not six foot two and I don't have a big round voice. So forget everything I've said. I don't care what people look like and how they dress. It's the truth. I don't care how you dress. I don't care how much education you got. This is the truth. Good grief, Charlie Brown. Now, let's continue reading. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and forbid him for a 2,000-year period... What for? Cast him into the place of no knowledge. He locked him away from the church. He forbid him from deceiving something. And he tells you here. And shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive. I've gone through that word, planeo. Plane, planeo, planetes. All these various words, it means to lead away from the true way that he should deceive the nations no more. Nations is the word ethnos. It means non-Jews. There's going to be a time period in time where a group of non-Jews, anything that's not a Jew is called a Gentile. So that the non-Jews will not be deceived. There's one... <laughs> It don't matter whether anybody believes that. That's the word ethnos. It just boggles my mind. Why hasn't anybody defined these words? There's a place where non-Jews are not going to be deceived. And if you have one non-Jew out of every tribe, one red non-Jew, one black non-Jew, one white non-Jew, 
one yellow non-Jew, one brown non-Jew, all these would be Gentiles. If you have one, synecdoche would apply here. There's going to be a 2,000-year period where the non-Jews will not be able to be deceived, and that's the Gentile church. And they were in prison, in darkness, from Adam until Jesus, weren't they? But Jesus says, when I come, I'm going to blind the eyes of the Jews. He says he did that in Luke, the 19th chapter. He looks out over Israel and says, Jerusalem, if thou hast known even now in this thy day the things that belong to thy peace, now they're hidden from your eyes. Now I'm going to pour out of my spirit on all flesh for a 2,000 year period. And they've taken this 2,000 years and called it 1,000 years. It's not. It's 2,000. And there's only one place in time. There's not a pre-trib rapture. And there's not a thousand years after this is over. The thousand years is what we're living in right now. It's a 2,000 year period. And we are in that time period. It's called kingdom of God. Oops, wait a minute. If I with the spirit of God cast out devils, the Holy Spirit is given to the Gentiles or the all flesh here now, isn't it? Only the Jews had the truth over here. One flesh had the truth. And the Gentiles were in darkness, weren't they? That's the spirits in prison, isn't it? Prison is the word phulake, P-H-U-L-A-K-E. It means the division of day and night are light and darkness. Was the Gentiles in prison? Were they in darkness? Yes, they were. Do you know that that word falake is used to trans translate the watches of the night? They had four watches in the night on their calendar. They had the evening watch that went from six to nine, evening watch. And then they had from 9 to 12, that was the midnight watch. And then they had from 12 to 3, that was the cock crow watch. And then they had the morning watch from 3 to 6, the morning watch. And when they use this word watch, that is translated from fulake to the word watch. When you have the word prison in the New Testament, it's the word fulake. It means the division of day and night or light and darkness. And the Gentiles were in darkness from Adam until Jesus. And then the all flesh is going to get the truth for a 2,000 year period. You say, Jim, aren't we past the year 2000? We do not have any calendars that are reliable. Remember, the calendar was redone by the Roman Catholics by a, what do you need? Hurry up. I'm, not, no, no, not to you. No, no, not then. No. The Jews were put in darkness when he comes in Jerusalem in Luke the 19th chapter. Luke 19. That's the end of the 69th week of Daniel, 70 weeks. Oh, I've, I've lost my place here. All right. So this 2,000-year period, I'm going to go back through the book of Isaiah. Isaiah. Isaiah is the same thing as Paul. Paul is the New Testament, Isaiah. Isaiah is the Old Testament, Paul. Paul was sent to the Gentiles. That was his mission. The Bible says in Galatians, the second chapter, that he was a missionary <coughs> to the uncircumcision, which was a term for Gentiles. And that Peter was a missionary to the circumcision, which was a term for the Jew 
because that was what was given to Abraham, the father of the Jews, in Genesis, the 17th chapter. That was given as the sign that Abraham and his descendants, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, would be his people. So, Isaiah talks all through his book about the, gen about the Jews have been in light. They're going to be taken to darkness. And he prophesies the New Testament church when he says the Gentiles are going to come to the light. That's the 2,000-year period. When this thing is over, it's going to be over. When we're taken out to meet the Lord in the air, it'll be done. I'm just surprised that these so-called great scholars don't define anything. I just, I look at John MacArthur. He seems to be a very bright, intelligent man. I can't believe he would believe in a pre-trib rapture and, and premillennialism. I'd like to talk to him. He and I are about a month apart. I'm about a month older than him. I don't have a formal education like he does. But he does not understand Scripture. I just can't believe that he says the things he says. He's got a tender heart about God who's living. But boy, he's got a mess. Charles Stanley don't have nothing. That man is so boring. I just, they need to put his sermons on Muzak. What's that sound in the background? Need to put, him, put his sermons in the insomniac session at the drugstore. Guaranteed to put you asleep in five minutes. I don't like these preachers that lead the church astray with all their false doctrine. <coughs> Jim, do you mind them not knowing? I don't mind a man not knowing. I do mind a man making stuff up or picking up somebody else's doctrine and preaching it as though it was truth without studying it himself. Anytime I study something, I don't believe everything that McClinic and Strong says. I may be reading along and say, this is good, this is good. You've got to remember, McClinic and Strong, 12-volume set, great set of encyclopedias, fantastic. So are the Hastings over there. But I have to evaluate everything that's being said because... There may have been 450 contributors to this. And a lot of them were real liberal, and some of them weren't, and some of them were real conservative. And you can't, you can't believe everything a man says. When you're reading, you have to learn to exegete from the book you're reading. Break, take out the facts, all the IEs, that is to say, study them. They may be right and they may be wrong. But define everything in sight. I believe in defining everything. When I teach on baptism, the thing that devastates water baptism is the word in. It destroys water baptism. There's three words for in in the Greek text. Not one of them means to move into and come out of. Epi and in and ice. And I'm out of time. I've got so much. What we're going to do. I'm going to move on into this chapter. We're going to look at the at the end of the millennium, our end of 2,000 years. We're going to go into Gog and Magog. This has an exact meaning. Gog and Magog is not, you don't have any preachers as a kid in a Baptist preacher's home and going to all these fellowship meetings I've heard, and they'll try to talk about Gog and Magog. All you have to do is look it up. All you have to do is look up Magog in your concordance and it'll take you back to the 10th chapter of Genesis. And Magog was one of the sons of, of uh, Japheth. And, the, and when you study the Japhethites, sons of Noah, they migrated up here to the Caucasus Mountains and they were Caucasians. And Caucasians were the most barbaric people that ever lived. These were Assyrians or Scythians. Nobody's been as barbaric as Caucasians some of the most evil people that ever lived upon the earth and they think they're better than everybody else I don't get along with Caucasians very well you know why they're running the show in America anybody that's ruling I can't get along with them if I move to Japan or if I move to China I won't be able to get along with yellow people whoever's ruling is corrupt. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Help us to see your word, Lord. 
Lord, lead us in this study. I want the people to see your word and what it means, Lord, not what popular opinion says. Help us to continue this message. Crush us under your hand. Get rid of self out of us. We'll praise you and glorify you for everything. In Christ's name, amen. I don't like Billy Graham. It's hard to get through this stuff. I can't hardly. I know I'm going to watch myself. I can't find out.